No, you probably would. No, you probably do. You should do it. Yeah, because really, I mean, you can draw a straight line, can't you? Yeah. So why you can't cut a straight line? Exactly. Go get the Clippers real quick. Come here, do that thing on camera right here in front of everybody. Just so you know, you on you on YouTube, so you show them how to just how you line yourself up. It's a it's a what they call it a tutorial. Yeah, no, nah, you good? You know what I'm saying? Just like this, do it with your glasses on too. You know what I'm saying? You just uh, you just like cut around the frame. You know what I'm saying? You just uh, you'll be all right. No, all right, my bad. <clears throat> Savage peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn that the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, but not of works, lest anyone should boast. And given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, baby girl, I need you to be quiet, please. She don't like when I say be quiet. She says, don't say that. Um, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Uh, so where we leave off last week? Last week, what did we talk about? Who's our king? Let me just ask y'all some specific questions. Who's our king right now? What's his name? No. Can't be just calling him David's son. What's somebody walks up to you? Are you Philip's son? Depending on who you talk to, it might be Fillmore's son. Or Slim son. His last name starts with the L. With the L? Lamad. What's David's son? Huh? Licorice. You don't know? Oh, yeah. Lilic. No, Alright, so his name was Solomon. Alright? So this is uh this is our King Solomon. King Solomon took over the, the 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 kingdom. After he took over the kingdom, what were some of the things that David had to talk about him before he died? Y'all remember? <laughs> Excuse me. Y'all remember David was having a little chat with his son before he died? What was he telling him? What was he asking Solomon to do for him? Y'all remember Joab? Fix him? What about Shimei? The one that was throwing rocks at David. Oh, so, um, yeah, he said, "No, you gotta deal with some of these people." All right, you remember? You met up. Remember? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Solomon's brother, Adonijah. You remember Adonijah? Adonijah, he wanted. You know what I'm saying? He came to moms. He came to Solomon mom. He was like, "Yo, what?" It's a live broadcast, boy. Come on. Come on. You ain't got it. Yeah, he did not make it up as he go. No, Talking about some what? Is, what was his name? I mean, uh, saw his brother, uh, like creeping on him. Yeah, I guess kind of. How was his brother creeping on him? What you got in your mouth? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, go ahead. How was your brother creeping on him? Yeah, yeah so his brother, he was he was talking to his mom. He, he was talking to Solomon's mom. And he was like, yeah, can you just ask this one thing of Solomon for me? And what he wanted to ask was, 
let me uh let me get you know what i'm saying let me get the young maiden you know what i'm saying i forget her name but let me get the young maiden it happened to be the same young lady that that was keeping david warm so the people would see that as david's woman king david's woman so he was trying to get t king david's woman he knew that by doing that people would see him likely as king right it's something that is something that uh, Adonijah's brother Absalom had tried to do before to David when when Absalom was trying to take the kingdom. So Solomon, being wise, he he spotted that immediately. He was like, no, 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 we're not doing that. Matter of fact, that boy about to die for this one. So he ended up killing Adonijah, right? He ended up uh, he ended up killing uh, Joab. He ended up uh, sending Abiathar, who was the priest. Ended up sending him um, and, and sending him away and taking the, the the priesthood away from him, or at least the service of the priesthood. He ended up uh, he ended up putting Shimei, kind of locking Shimei in Jerusalem, and telling him that he couldn't leave. Now some years went by and he actually left. And then you know what I'm saying because he left, he killed he killed Shimei too. You know what I'm saying? Who else? Is that it? I feel like I'm missing one. You got Shimei, Abiathar, um, Joab, and, and uh, he took care of uh, and Adonijah. He took care of uh, the family of. Uh, mm, that's the one we missing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Then some of the folks that was looking out for uh, I forget what was it, what was his name? Barzillai. Yeah, so Barzillai, who was looking out for for David when David was on the run from Absalom. Go, go open. If somebody try to get you, just run. They um uh, and get your butt up here and sit down. Sorry, boy. I didn't. I, you know, I forgot you were down there. Um. So he was trying to look out for. He was trying to look. Yeah, who is that? Um. He was trying to. He was trying to look out for the people. I mean, he was trying to look out for uh, Nana. He was trying to look out for David, and uh. David was like, well, you know, David tried to look out for Barzillai as well. And Barzillai was like, man, I'm an old man. You know what I mean? What a little like, I can't even taste food. I can't even hear the people singing. It don't make no sense for you to try to look out for me. You know what I'm saying? Just do good for my boy here. So David told Solomon, he said, listen, make sure they got a spot at your table. His whole family. You know what I'm saying? His sons, rather. You know what I'm saying? Make sure they got make sure they got a spot at your table. Because, you know what I'm saying? That's what that's what we're looking to do. Hey, Nana, how you doing? I know you was over here. Huh? I said, I didn't know you was over here. What you, what you, okay. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's somewhat where we left off is just David instructing his son to kind of set the kingdom in order and to close out all the situations that David was dealing with back in the day, right? Back in his day, all the things that he never closed out. So now it's an opportunity for, for Solomon to come do that. He closed those things out and that's where we ended the chapter. So let's go ahead and pick it up at, uh, uh, second King, um, first Kings chapter two. This is first Kings chapter. what I say? Yeah. Chapter three, my fault. First Kings chapter three. I thought I'll start chapter three. And Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until mm -hmm. he had made an end of building his own house mm -hmm. in the house of Yahuwah the wall of Jerusalem round about. Mm -hmm. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of Yahuwah until those days. Right? So it said the people sacrificed in high places. Right? But our law had already instructed us don't sacrifice in high places. Right? It told us specifically our law it, it, it commanded us to go and tear down the high places of the people. But instead, because there was no house built, what we did is we tend to kind of look at where everybody sacrificed in the land before us. And we would make our sacrifices to the most high God, but we would do it in the high places. Right. We would do it in the places where other people would sacrifice to their other gods. You know what I'm saying? So it's like even to this day, you could still see like if you if you look out, where's that on the east side? You know what I'm saying? You look out on the east side and you like you look out there, you can see it's a big church on the hill. You know what I'm saying? And I think they got one on the West. Like, you know what I'm saying? Going towards Summerlin, too. Yeah, they got, uh, they got one in Summerlin, too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's like people still look for hills and then they'll place a church there. You know what I'm saying? Buffalo, you 
see that one right there, that ICU or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like, you know what I'm saying? That's what people try to find high places, and that's where they put, you know what I'm saying? That's where they put their little places of worship. That because, you know what I'm saying? It's still, you know what I'm saying? These, the same evil spirits that was leading people to do stuff then, the same evil spirits leading people to do stuff now. That's it. That's one of the things that you have to understand about the world and about life. You know what I'm saying? Everything is spirits. You know what I'm saying? It's not stuff that you really see. You don't really, you know what I'm saying? You don't really see it's stuff that you deal with internally, but it's spirits. You know what I'm saying? Now, you don't recognize when people say spirits because things have been all mysticized for us and all that. But, like, if you gave spirits a different name, you might call it, like, I don't know, mental health. You know what I'm saying? You might call it, like, depression. You know what I'm saying? Like, you might, you might call it, you might call it, like, an anger issue, or you might call it this, or you might call it, like, it's, it's stuff that's been diagnosed and we've given names to it. But the reason why, you know what I'm saying, they, they, like, they put you on medication. Like, what do you, what do you think medication and drugs, what do you think that is? <laughs> what, hmm? Suppressing, they could be suppressants, but what it does is spiritually, right? Spiritually, what these medications do is they open your body up to spirits, right? So you take you take medication, and scientifically, what it's doing is, oh, it's changing the chemical balance in your body and your endorphins and all these different things. That's how the scientists are explaining what's happening. What what's actually happening is. Spirits are interacting with your body, which is triggering endorphins, right? And so there's a piece of what's going on that we don't see. And all that stuff is causing things to happen inside of you, right? And so we take medication to, to, to do one thing, right, to try to help us out. And maybe something's happening on the other end, too. Not all spirits are bad. Not all spirits are good. But it's all this stuff constantly happening around us. Right. And some people are more open and more prone to be under attack for a certain spirits or not because of how they were born and how they were raised and all these different things is constantly happening. But you have to understand that's why the book tell us our war is not with flesh and blood. Right. It's with spirit, spiritual warfare that we all because it's all this stuff that's going on, all these principalities, all these things that rule this world. That we dealing with and we don't see them and we don't fight. That's why it's important not to take offense to what what interactions with people do because people are reacting to something else. Right? You kind of gotta let stuff roll off your darn back. You gotta let what you see roll off your darn back and stay focused on the prize. Because the way to make spirits react is to make sure that you react and only to what God is doing. Then the spirits gotta fall in line. Whether they're good or bad, they gotta fall in line, they gotta do what they gotta do what they supposed to do. But an evil spirit's job is to get you distracted and get you off the path. That's the purpose. A good spirit is to keep you on the path. So if you ever try to wonder, like, you know, I wonder if it's a good spirit or a bad spirit, you know what I'm saying? Line it up with the book. These people that be burning this sage, you know what, you know why they say they burn sage? They do the sage and they burn it, do that thing. What they do with the sage? Now ain't the first one is the this one, they got the bowl, you know what I'm saying? You got a little grits bowl with the smasher. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But they got two. They got the grits bowl with the smasher, though. You know what I'm saying? You do that. Yeah, you do like this. You know what I'm saying? You know what that's supposed to be doing? Clearing evil spirits. Then you burn the sage. You get the sage. You do that like a big old blunt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You like that thing. You know what I'm saying? Look. We don't know, but you like that thing. Be like, you know what I'm saying? Then they like this. Remember Angie tried to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You go like this, you know what I'm saying? Get doing all that, that. And then what they they doing is you you lighten it and in their mind what they doing is I'm getting rid of evil spirits. Guess what's really happening though? Oh, you bring an evil spirit. That too. You bring an evil spirit right to you. You calling the evil spirits. Right? You calling all types are you calling spirits, right? You know what I'm saying? You just calling spirits. So we do stuff and we have no idea, right? A lot of stuff, you ever heard of po positive affirmations, mm -hmm. right? You have like you positive affirmation. You look in the mirror and you say, every morning I'm going to tell myself, you are beautiful. You are strong. Today is going to be a great day. And you look at it, right? You're going to be positive. You're not going to let anything affect you. You're going to be a good person today. Right. You say that to yourself and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it. 
But what happens when you repeat something to yourself that you don't necessarily believe? What if I don't believe I'm beautiful? What if I don't believe that I'm going to be a good person today? Right? What if I have doubts internally? The stuff that I'm fighting with is I'm such a horrible person. Right? I keep doing messed up stuff to people. I'm such a bad person. But I, every day in the mirror, because I don't want to be a bad person anymore, what I tell myself, I look in the mirror and I say, you're a good person. What happens when I step out the door? I tell myself you're a good person, but deep down what I really believe, I'm a bad person. And then I step out the door with these two different thoughts, very different thoughts. What happens? What's going to happen? Max, what do you think going to happen? How do you think the day going to play out? What happens if it's bad? But the expectation that you set for yourself this morning was, I'm going to be a good person. You know, we go crazy. You know what I'm saying? Or mental health or we get depressed or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you know, the word we want to get. They got a new one now. They say overstimulated. You know what I'm saying? Y'all heard that one yet? Y'all heard overstimulated? I'm just overstimulated. Right? They got all these little phrases to describe, but you know what's being described? It's the distance between reality, what really happens, and the expectation that we have. The wider that wider that distance is, right? The wider the wider it is, what I expect versus what really is going to happen, the harder it is for us to deal with mentally. And so, the more that we tell ourselves that it's something that we don't actually believe, and then we go out with that expectation. But what we actually believe is what turns out to be the case, right? I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna be a good person today. But you know what? I haven't done anything to change my behavior. So when this person come up to me and he say something to me, guess what? I'm gonna cuss his butt out. And when I see this uh, opportunity to take from that person, guess what? I'm still gonna take. All these are the same things to kids contribute to my idea of me not being a good person. I haven't dealt with any of the behavior. But guess what? I'm gonna tell myself. Today, I'm going to be a good person. Instead of saying, I'm no longer going to steal. I'm no longer going to cheat. I'm no longer going to lie, even if it hurt me. Right? I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to be good. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do because that's the law. And I'm going to hold myself accountable when it happens. And then plan for when it don't happen. If it don't happen, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. If it do happen, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Now your expectations are close to reality. You're not only hoping for one thing. You, you, you assessing for all options. That's how you keep yourself sane. That's how you keep, when I say sane, that's how you keep spirits from penetrating and bring you into what people are calling depression, overstimulation, and all these different things that we call it. All it is is spirits ruling us. It's emotions, right? Emotions are spirit. So the spirit's ruling us and calling us to do something. You ever been really happy and did something stupid? Right? You just get super happy. You don't even care nothing about anybody else. Oh, I love you so much. And to do something stupid. It happens. That's a spirit too. It don't matter if it's a good emotion or a bad emotion. All of them can cause us, if we're not grounded in reality, it can cause us to do things we don't, we don't want to do. Or that we wouldn't do otherwise. That's why it's important you have to ground yourself in truth. You have to ground yourself in principle. Because when you do that, now you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not just, you know what I'm saying, distracted by anything that's happening around the world. You know what I'm saying? You focus on something very specific. All right, keep going. Watch this. And Solomon loved Yahuwah walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. Mm -hmm. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. Mm -hmm. For there, for that, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer up on an altar, on that altar. In Gibeon, Yahuwah appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night. And God, and God said, "Ask what shall I give thee?" Right. So in Gibeon, Yahuwah appeared unto uh, Solomon, and it was nighttime. And Yahuwah asked him. He is like. Go ahead and ask me for something and I'll give it to you. Go ahead and ask me what I what I should be giving to you, rather. 
Right? Let's see. Dodo. Most I got to ask you that. Most I got to pop up right now. Right? And he just speaks to you, hear him, so you know it's him too. Most I got to pop up to you. He say, ask me for something that you think I should give you. What you say? What you going to ask for? A better life? Okay. What you going to ask for? Well, that's funny. <laughs> what you going to ask for? What you going to ask for, Zahar? A house. A house? What you asking for? You don't know? What you ask for, Ezri? What you going to ask for? Why the older kids don't want to? What you going to ask for? Wisdom. What you going to ask for, TJ? Help your mom. What you going to ask for? You said better life. What does, what does that mean? What's a better life? What do you mean, though? Don't be giving me the answer that I, you think I want to hear. I want to hear what y'all would ask for. Most of God talking to you, you, you going to ask him, give me a job? <laughs> what in the world is this about? You gotta, all right. Well, I ain't gonna judge your ass now. You know what I'm saying? That's whatever you want to ask, I guess. Right? Look at what, look, look, you know what I'm saying? We about to look at what Solomon asked for. And Solomon said, You have showed unto your servant David, my father, great mercy. Mm -hmm. As he walked before you in truth, mm -hmm. and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart. Mm -hmm. You have kept for him this great kindness. You have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of David, my father. And I am but a little child. Mm -hmm. I know not how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the middle of your people, which you have chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor <coughs> counted for multitude. Mm -hmm. Give, therefore, your servant an understanding heart to judge your people. All right. And be discerned between good and bad. All right. Who is able to judge this thy so great people? So now, what did Solomon just ask for? He asked for an understanding heart and the ability to know good versus evil that he can judge this great people. He asked for understanding and wisdom. Right? Wisdom is, is being able to understand right from wrong. Right? It's being able to look at a situation and be like, you know what? This is what should happen in this situation. This is what should not happen in this situation. That's what wisdom is. Right. You have understanding, you have wisdom and you have um, and you have knowledge. Right. So knowledge is like they're facts. Right. You know, facts. Right. I know that it takes three hundred and sixty five days for the sun to circle the earth. Right. Wisdom is understanding what's right and what's wrong. Right. So then wisdom would be OK. The sun is going around the earth. Maybe I don't know how many days, but I do know when it's light on light outside, that's when I should go to work. Because when it's not light outside, it's harder for me to see when I'm working outside. Right. So wisdom tells you this is a better time to do something. Right. This is good. This is the right time to do it. This is the wrong time to do it. And then understanding. Right. Understanding kind of bridges both of those gaps. Right. It's like, okay, you know the right way to do something and you know you have knowledge. Understanding pulls both of those together and makes it, ah, this is why this works together, right? Because the sun goes around 365 days of the year, then that means I should approximately have this many days that I'll be able to work. That could work out to about 12 hours. So understanding is you bring all of this stuff together and say, okay, I can work for 12 hours. This, that, and the other. I'm probably going to get tired. I pull all this stuff together. That's why all these different components are important. In the world, you have some people that are very knowledgeable. But they may not have great understanding. They may not have great wisdom. Right? So their decision, if you don't have great wisdom, 
you make poor decisions. You might do stuff that's foolish, right? You make decisions that might get you in trouble because you haven't made a decision about, I mean, you haven't gotten an understanding about what's right and what's wrong. So you might often do wrong things, right? Person, you might have a person with great wisdom, but they don't have great understanding. So they make good decisions, but they don't know why they're doing it. They just do it, right? And then you have people with great understanding, but maybe they don't have much wisdom. So it's like, hey, I can explain everything to you. I can break it down to you. But when it actually comes time to discipline myself to actually do it, I don't make those decisions because I don't have wisdom to tell me I understand it. I understand what the right thing is, but I don't actually do it because I don't have the wisdom to do it. Right. It's very important that you understand those three differences because some of us are going to lack in certain areas. And it's important to, to fit yourself with people that'll that'll feed into you. And that'll build where you do where you have lacks, right? Where you don't have maybe understanding, you get people around you that do have understanding. So when you have run into an issue, you say, hey, let me talk to somebody with wisdom and understanding to help me through what I'm trying to get through. That's what that's what God put us here for. So we can try to rely on each other and we can ask each other for assistance when people are capable in the places that we're not capable. Okay. So Solomon asked for both of them, understanding and wisdom. Watch this. Keep going. In the speech please Yahuwah that Solomon had asked this thing. Mm -hmm. I said unto him, because you have asked this thing and did not ask for yourself a long life, neither did you ask for riches for yourself. All right, so look at it. He didn't ask for a long life, right? That's kind of what Matt was asking for, right? Matt was looking like, man, you know what I'm saying? I just kind of want to grow up, you know what I'm saying? Get married, you know what I'm saying? Have a couple kids, you know what I'm saying? He looking, you know what I'm saying? Max, I'm like, yeah, I just want me a nice little, a better life, a nice long life, right? We asked for riches. Who asked for riches? That was a hard. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? For a house, you know what I'm saying? The hard asked for riches. You know what I'm saying? He's like, yeah, he didn't because you didn't ask for riches. What else he asked for? And has not asked for yourself a long life. Neither have you asked for riches for yourself. Nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to your word. Mm -hmm. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. So right. There was none like wise you you. and understanding. So there is none like you before you, mm -hmm. neither after you shall arise like you. Mm -hmm. And I have also given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall... Not be any among the kings like unto you all your days. Right? So this is what this is what Nana asked for. Right? She is like wisdom. So because he asked for wisdom and understanding, guess what? The most high God said, I'm gonna give you that, but I'm also gonna give you the stuff that you didn't ask for. You didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for a long life, and you didn't ask for your enemies. You didn't ask for me to go kill your enemies. So because of that, guess what? I'm going to give you riches, I'm going to give you a long life, and I'm going to go take care of your enemies for you. Right? But I'm going to give you what you also ask for is wisdom. Right? He asked for wisdom, but as you can see, it takes wisdom to even ask for that. Solomon already had the wisdom. So now the Most High God is just about to increase his wisdom. It's one thing that is in the book, there's a couple things, but one of the things in the book that the Most High God says that he gives freely to all who ask is wisdom. So when y'all sit down and y'all have y'all moments and y'all pray, ask for understanding, ask for wisdom, but add to that, right? Solomon asked for those things and we're going to learn about what happened with Solomon, right? I want you to add to that. Ask for an obedient heart, right? Understanding, wisdom, and obedient heart. If you pull those three, and stay faithful to Most High God. Just see what He give you. See what He turn over to you. That's the prayer that I always ask for, not the obedient heart. You know what I'm saying? I didn't until, until I started reading the book. I didn't understand the importance of that. But I used to always. I heard this story when I was a young kid, and I used to always be like, you know, man, I want some riches. So guess what I'm asking for? Wisdom. That's what Solomon did. Now my goal was to try to get some riches. You know what I'm saying? But I know Solomon. He learned how to trick the game. I was like. All right. I'm going to ask for wisdom. So I used to pray all the time. God, just give me wisdom and understanding. 
wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. And while I believe God did give me that in my life, He absolutely, He didn't give me them darn riches. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how. You know what I'm saying? You just can't figure it out with this guy. You know what I'm saying? I ain't get the darn riches. But I do believe that the man gave me wisdom and understanding. Right? I, be, I believe that at a pretty young age, I was able to understand stuff that I don't think I would have been understand, been able to understand without those prayers. Right? So I want y'all to pray about those things. And I want y'all, because it's important that y'all are able to make decisions in this life. It's, it's tough right now. It's tough. And I'm only comparing it to when I was younger. It's way it's so many distractions. It's so many excuses that this world will give y'all. And it's all a setup. It's like they'll give you an excuse and then they're using it against you later. You know what I'm saying? They'll tell you, they'll tell you, look, this is what they'll tell you. Whoever heard of CPS? What does CPS do? It protects children, right? So, like, if you got a dad, right? That has a bat. And every time he mad at his son, he just smack him over the head with the bat. What should happen to that dad? His butt should be in jail. Who would help with that situation? CPS. CPS is the one that's supposed to come in and be like, man, look, dog, you wilding out. Holy, come get this man. Right? Their job is to protect the children. Now, you have a dad that has a belt. Like me. Right? I'll whoop across that darn butt. Bow, bow, bow. What might CPS do? Or they might come to me and they say, hey, you're abusing your child. And they might try to call the police on me. And they might try to send me to jail just like the dad that smacked his kid over the head with the bat that he belong in jail, right? They might try to treat me the same way because they may not have the understanding and wisdom to separate the two things, right? Here's the thing. CPS, this institution that is helping kids and truly is helping most of the kids or a lot of the kids that they deal with, they might also hurt the kid. So they might say, hey, don't hurt, don't, don't punish your kid in that way, right? Y'all get put in a position where y'all say, you're right, I shouldn't be punished in that way. But then when you get older, you pick up bad behaviors. Dad that went to jail is not there to protect you from that bad behavior by whooping your darn butt. Then you go into the streets and you learn, oh, out here, instead of getting grounded, I get put in jail. Instead of my toys and things, my allowance being taken away from me, now I'm poor because I'm fired from jobs. Right? Instead of getting whoopings, people are beating my butt or trying to kill me. The punishment, nobody stops the punishment when you get out there in the real world. It ain't no CPS. Like when you get in the real world, it's no CPS to protect you from a punishment. It's gonna happen to you. You grow up, you're gonna go to jail. Somebody's gonna try to kill you. Somebody's gonna try to beat you up. They're gonna try to hurt you. They're gonna try to take food out of your mouth, your family mouth. You're gonna be poor. Those are the punishments of real life. Right. Money is taken from you. You're locked up in prison or in jail. Right. These are the real things that happen to people when you don't follow the rules or the laws of the land or the rules at your job or whatever it might be. These are the reasons that parents have to put these things in place. The reason why it's so tough for you all mm -hmm. is because now there are a lot of people that have overcorrected things of the past and they think they're protecting you. But what they do is they set expectations for you that when you get into the to the world, the real world as an adult, the world don't work the way it was working when you was a kid. And so now the punishments that you avoided as a kid are tenfold as an adult, and there's no one to protect you from. It. In fact, there's no one even interested. All this protection you got as a kid, you see none of it when you're an adult. So now it confuses you. Because it goes back to the expectation. Your expectation is, hey, everything in the world should function the way I think it's supposed to function. Right? People are supposed to say the right things to each other. People are always supposed to say sorry when something happens. Just that you start to set up all these expectations 
because people are protecting you from reality. And then you reach reality and all that. You turn 18, 19, everything moves. No more protection. And the world just start hitting you. It's not fair that I'm not making as much money as this person. It's not fair that I can't be who I want to be. It's not fair that all these things are happening and the whole world looking at you like, boy, if you don't clock in for darn work, you fired. Get out of here. It's not fair that I got fired from my job and nobody listening to you. Now you're on the street. Hold on. It's not fair that I got fired. Can I have a couple of dollars? Then somebody say something to you. Like, boy, if you don't, why don't you go to work? I did go to work. Who you talking to? Bow! Punch you in your darn mouth because you thought you could just talk to people however they wanted to talk to. It's not fair. I was just saying words. You ain't fair you punch me in my face. Right? This is life. This is real life. So what our job is, is to prepare you for real life. Prepare you to not have any excuse. What I tell you all the time? No excuses. No excuses. I tell you the same thing. No excuses. Right? I don't really care what happened to you. I don't really care if you leave your backpack. What I tell you? I don't care what the jerk. You get into a fight on the bus. Somebody stole and ran with your backpack. What I'm doing to you? You still getting a whooping. Because your mind got to be right. How do I prevent anything from happening when I'm responsible for it? You win something, you lose something. But guess what? When you lose, you got to deal with the consequence. No protection about that. You won't get it from me, at least. Right? Because I'm setting you up for the real world. I'm making sure that you prepare for how things work. It don't matter how mean people be into you. It don't matter how much, how much, stuff, how much, how much, how much unfair things are happening to you. You have to figure it out, react to it, and deal with it. Right? And you got support. You got help. You got wise and intelligent people around you to help you do that. Y'all blessed in that way. Right? But we can't succumb to a victim world. We can't, we can't become victim to stuff that's happening to us. We got to make sure we press forward, we steam forward, we never, we never give up. We always keep God's word. We always, we always obey what he's having us do. Because that way, if we do that, then we solid. Can't nothing touch it. Whole world got to work for us, even if they don't know it. Everything, when you serve God, the whole world has to work for you. Right? You can serve God, you can be poor, but guess what? All these rich people, guess what they storing up riches for? The righteous. The people who do what the Most High God say. All that stuff going to come down. And that's your kids that got their riches. The problem that we have is, I'm, y'all may not believe it, y'all really haven't seen nobody that's righteous. Right? The world, like, if you look out in the world, like, it ain't no, you can't turn on the TV and see no, somebody that's righteous to God. Don't exist. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't see that. You might go to church and you're not seeing righteous people. You might you might go to your school and you might you not see righteousness. So we we have to because we don't see what real righteousness looks like. We start defining the world by what good people look like in our own estimation. And the world gonna tell you good people are the ones that got the money, got doing good for themselves. You know, got a nice house, nice car, famous celebrities. So then, when you see righteousness, it starts feeling wrong. All right. It's important that we understand we have to judge by what the books say, not by what this world is showing us. You ain't, you ain't showing us nothing that's controlled by spirits. This, is the, this, is the, this, this world is controlled by spirits. We need to be controlled by God. All right. So he gave him wisdom. Let's see what else. And if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David did walk. Then I will lengthen your days. Mm -hmm. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of Yahuwah and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Mm -hmm. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. All right, now watch this. It's two women that are harlots, right? When the books say harlots, that means that they had sex and they weren't married. All right, so these are women that had sex and they weren't married. Harlot is like saying whore or prostitute, right? 
So the idea is that when we look at like a whore or a prostitute now, you're thinking of like somebody who has sex for money. All right. That's what a whore or a prostitute would be. It would be someone who says, hey, I'll have sex with you, but you have to pay me money. It's kind of how we kind of look at it. But this is not what this is. Anyone who has who, anyone who trades, right, their bodily functions in that way for anything other than a long term committed marriage would be considered a whore or a prostitute. Right. So these are two harlots. They are we're going to learn they got babies. Watch this. And the one woman said, oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. Mm -hmm. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. Mm -hmm. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house except we two in the house. Right. So they were pregnant at the same time. One had a baby. Three days later, the other had a baby. With nobody else in the house because they, they, they harlots. Right. So they don't have men. That, that kind of married them and stayed with them. So they just left with their own babies. The other guys are gone, right? So what you call that today, we call that like a single mom, right? So they sing, they, they both single moms, no dad is around, and they live in the same house. They got young babies. One baby is three years old or three days old when the other baby was born, right? So they three days apart, they babies, both little infants. Watch what happened. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. Right? So she's looking like, my baby, cool. She slept with her baby. She rolled over. And when you say overlaid it, she rolled over on the baby and killed the baby on an accident. So she's telling you, her baby died. My baby is good. Watch this. And she rose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thy handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. Right? So then she's saying, I'm accusing this woman of switching our babies out when I was asleep. She accidentally killed her baby. She woke up. She put her baby by me and she took my baby who was alive as you put it. Right. Let's see. And then when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. Mm -hmm. And the other woman said, no, but the living is my son and the dead is your son. Mm -hmm. And this and this said, no, but the dead is your son and the living is my son. Mm -hmm. Thus they spake before the king. Right. So now the scenario is I got a baby. You got a baby. You accidentally roll over on your baby. You come over here. You try to you, you you steal my baby and then give me the dead baby and pretend like I killed my baby. Well, really, you killed your baby. So you stole my baby from me, right? There's a scenario. So now Solomon, as the king, has to provide judgment and say what should happen. This is where the wisdom play, right? What should happen in this situation? Who's telling the truth? Who's not? So watch how he deals with this. Then said the king, the one says, this is my son that lives. And your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead. And my son is the living. Mm -hmm. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. All right. So you got these two women. They arguing. She there's one baby between the two women. It used to be two. One died. And they both arguing like, no, this is my baby. The other one like, no, this is my baby. Now, we know one of these women lied. One of these women, they have a dead baby that they accidentally rolled over on. Right. And the other woman, her baby was stolen. They both saying that 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 this is their baby. So Solomon say, we don't solve this problem. Somebody give me a sword. Watch this. And the king said, divide the living child in two and get half to the one and half to the other. He said, go ahead and cut the baby in half and then let them split the baby. I'm going to kill the baby. I'm going to cut the baby in half. You take half of the baby. You take the other half of the baby. Right? That's how he's going to solve this problem. Watch this. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor yours, but divide it. Mm -hmm. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Right? So one of them was like, because she lost her baby. She was like, Yeah, well, that's fair to me. 
Then the other one's like, no, 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 it ain't even, it ain't necessary. Just let her keep the baby. If you got to kill the baby, just go ahead and keep it. So King Solomon looked at that and say, that got to be the mama. Because the mama, this is my baby. I would prefer that somebody else take care of my baby than my baby be killed. Right? That's the mindset that we've had. So he said, okay, well, that's the person that deserved the baby. Why does that type of logic work? Why would that wisdom work? Because you, you see how you see in our culture how moms was about their children. <laughs> he looking at how the mom is for the child. The, when you look at things at a principle level, right? When you look at when you look at things with wisdom, you look at it at a principle level, right? So you go past the the surface, right? You have people arguing at the surface. Well, no, this, no, I slept this way and this, that, no, I didn't steal your baby, this, that, and other. You can't prove none of that. It wasn't the camera to show you. You can't prove it. So now what matters most for a baby and a mom? Is that the mom is willing to take care of the baby and the mom puts that baby's life above her own. Right? So he asks a question and say, okay, I'll kill the baby and y'all can split the baby. It doesn't matter at this point who is the biological mother. If one mom is saying, no, it's not that serious. Just let the kid live. And the other mom is saying, nope, that's fair. Go ahead and kill the baby then. It, uh, that may, let's say that is because we are moms that get abortions all, all the time. Right? So maybe that was the biological mom. At this point, it doesn't matter. The better mother for this child is the one who wants to keep it. Right. The one who wants this child to live. So at this point, it's a win win scenario because I'm looking at it at a principle level. I'm not looking at it at the surface. I'm not having an argument about details that don't really matter. That can't be proven at the bottom line. What matters most in the scenario is the baby needs someone that cares about it. OK, good. You want the baby to live. It goes to you. Right. That's what wisdom does. Wisdom is not trying to figure out details that that can't be you know what i'm saying like you can't prove it it don't matter is it no 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 wizards what's the bottom line how do we get to it what's the most accurate way to get to that bottom line right so that's an example of solomon's wisdom and how, kind of the way he would he would solve some of the problems that he came across let's keep going and all israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged and they feared the king for they saw that the wisdom of god was in them to do judgment mm -hmm. So King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were the princes which he had. Hold on. And these were the princes which he had. Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. Mm -hmm. uh, Elif, Elifereth, mm -hmm. Eli, Eli Horeth. And Ahiah, the sons of Shaisha, mm -hmm. scribes. Jehoshaphat, the son of Eli Elihu, the reporter. Mm -hmm. And then Ahiah, the son of... Shh, be quiet. Go to your brother. Ezri, quiet. TJ, take her in the room and find out what's wrong with her. And ben Aiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. Mm -hmm. And Zebu, the son of Nathan, was principal officer and the king's friend. And Ahishar was over the household. And Ad Adoniram, the son of Abda, was over the tribute. Mm -hmm. And Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man his month in a year made provision. Mm -hmm. And these are their names: the son of Ur in Mount Ephraim, the son of Dekar in Mekaz, and she Shealibi, and Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan, the son of Heset in Arubah. To him pertained Soko and all the land of Hephir, the son of Abinadab and all the region of Dor, which is Tephath, the daughter of Solomon to wife, which had Tephath, the daughter of Solomon to wife. Baana, the son of Elihu, to him pertained Tanak and Megiddo, and Beth Shean, which is by Zartana, 
beneath Jezreel from Beth Shean to Abel Meholah, even unto the place that is beyond Jachnian. The son of Geber in Ramoth Gilead, to him pertain the towns of Jair and the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, to him also pertain the region of Argob, which is in Bishan. Three score great cities with walls and brazen bars. Ahinadab, the son of Ido in Mahanaim. Ahimeaz was in Naphtali. He also took Basmath, the daughter of Solomon's wife. Baana, the son of Hushai, was Asher, was in Asher and Eloth. Jehoshaphat, the son of Perua in Issachar. Shimei, the son of Elah in Benjamin. Geber, the son of Uri, Uri was, the was the country of Gilead, in the country of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and all king of Bashan. And he was the only officer which was in the land. Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms, from the river unto the land of the Philistines, and unto the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. Mm -hmm. And Solomon's provision was one day, and for one day was thirty measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal, ten fat oxen, twenty fat twenty oxen out of the pastures, and had a hundred sheep besides hearts and roebucks and fellow deer and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tis, from Tif, Tifsa even to Aza over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man there under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So how did he control all of the area? Yeah, well, he had, he had officers. Captain. Well, how did that, how did that come about? How did he even get there? He set it up. Yeah, I remember when, when Absalom, after Absalom died, Y'all remember what David did? Y'all remember we looked he, at that map? What did he do? Conquer, he conquered a bunch of land? He conquered all the little land. Remember he conquered Ammon? Conquered Moab? He went up to Zidon? Yeah, he conquered Zidon? He came back down to Gath? Conquered the Philistines? Right? And the Ammonites, they were trying to be rebellious. They tried to de team up with the, uh, uh, the people of Zidon. And he went in, whooped on them. Joab helped them out. Right. Ultimately, he conquered all these lands and put these people under tribute. <clears throat> so that was David that did all this. David set all this up. They was already under tribute under David. Now you have the David. I mean, yeah, David's son, Solomon. He comes in a wise man. He's able to enhance what David already put in place through his wisdom. So then he set up officers over different territories. To kind of keep things level, and they made provisions. In other words, they had to provide for the king. So that means that they had to get it from somewhere. Let's learn about it. Let's see. And Solomon had forty thousand stalls of horses for his chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen. And those officers provided victuals for King Solomon, and for all that came unto King Solomon's table, every man in his month, they lacked nothing. Right. So it was an officer's responsibility to provide gifts. And, and food and everything for everybody that's related to uh, Solomon. Right? And they had to do it once a month. It's 12 of them, and they had to do it once a month. Right? Let's keep going. Barley also and straw for the horses and dromedaries brought they unto the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. Mm -hmm. And God... It, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much in largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Mm -hmm. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Heman, the Charco, Char and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. All right? So that's why you have some of the Psalms are written by Solomon. You have a whole book of Proverbs. Most of that is written by Solomon. And the Song of Solomon. You got the Songs of Solomon. And then you also got Ecclesiastes. Uh, uh, no, Ecclesiastes is written by Jeremiah. I'm no, no, it's Ecclesiastes uh, written by Solomon. I'm thinking about Lamentations. Yeah. Ecclesiastes yeah. by Solomon. 
So you have Ecclesiastes also written by Solomon. Ecclesiastes going to change my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So these are these are all books of wisdom that are in this Bible that are all written by this man Solomon. All right? he, he plays a part in writing all these books uh, all written by this man Solomon. Right? So he's a very wise man and he shared his wisdom. He shared his knowledge. All right, let's see. Keep going. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard his wisdom. All right. So you think of him like a scientist. Right. He was able to explain her like a teacher, right? A teacher of science. He was able to explain, hey, this is how the trees work. All right? This is how the sap that comes out of the trees, this is how that works. This is how the birds, and this is how the, like, he would just explain how things work in the world. And people, because he was so smart, people from all around the world would come and try to learn from him. They'd be like, oh, this, that, and other. Right? A lot of the knowledge, they never going to give us credit for it, but a lot of the knowledge in the world came from Solomon. It came from, it came from the things that we were doing. Right, came from Hebrews, period, but came from Solomon. Right, keep going. Watch this. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram, Hiram was ever a lover of David. Mm -hmm. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, "You know how that David, my father, could not build a house unto the name of Yahuwah, his God, for the wars which he were, uh, which were about him on every side, until Yahuwah put him under the soles of his feet." Mm -hmm. Put them under the soles of his feet. But now, Yahuwah my God has given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurring. And behold, I purpose to build a house into the name of Yahuwah my God, as Yahuwah spake unto David my father, saying, Your son, whom I set upon my throne, on your throne, in your room, he shall build a house into my name. Now therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon. And my servants shall be with your servants, and unto you will I give hire for my servants, according to all that you shall appoint. For you know that there is not among us any that can, any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, "Blessed be Yahuwah this day, which has given unto David a wise son over this great people." Mm -hmm. And Hiram sent to Solomon saying, "I have considered the things which you sent for sent to me for." And I will do all thy desire concerning timber and cedar and concerning timber of fir. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea and floats uh, upon, unto the place that you shall appoint me and will cause them to be discharged there. And you shall receive them and you shall accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees. According to all his desire, and Solomon gave Hiram twenty thousand measures of wheat for food to his household, and twenty measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they two made a league together. And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was thirty thousand men. And he sent and he sent them to Lebanon ten thousand a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon, and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the levy. And Solomon had 70,000 that bear burdens and 60,000 cures in the mountains, besides the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work. 3,300 which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them in the in the stone squares, so they prepare timber and stones to build the house. All right. So if you look at what just happened, Solomon made a deal with Hiram. So remember, we talked about King Hiram. This is the one that the Freemasons would, would suggest that, you know what I'm saying, he, he designed the temple. But no, we see exactly what he did. Just provided the, the temple. What he did is, and, and that, that even just it provided works. it, they just made a deal. Mm -hmm. King Tyler's like, yo, I mess with your daddy. Well, actually, it's the other way around. Solomon's like, yo, I know you messed with my daddy. I need something from you. King Tyler's like, no, nah, you know I did mess with your daddy. You know what? That's a good little deal. You send me the food and the oil, I'm going to send you the, 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 the trees. Because Solomon told him, like, listen, man, look. Ain't nobody I didn't, got trees like this. I done been around a few places. The way y'all boys cut some trees, boy. 
I'm saying, now nah, y'all can cut a tree. You know what I'm saying? I'll tell you what. I'll send you some wheat, some oil, year by year. You know what I'm saying? What'd you say? This much? All right, well, I'll give you a, put a little bit of more on it then. I think it's cracking to be employed by Solomon. Like, you know what I'm saying? You got two two months at home, go go work for a month. Mm -hmm. Then, you know what I'm saying? He is like, Tyre said, okay, look, I'll do you one better. I'm going to put the wood on floats. I'm going to send it down, down the sea to you. And you pick it up off of the border and you bring it in. Easy money. That way you ain't got to have people carrying it from way up north all the way down. That's a big, that's a huge walk. So they had this little system that they working. They set up a bunch of people. They all the workers. They set up some men to be over the workers. That's creating jobs. Like, man, talking about they creating jobs. Like, no, no. There's a creating job. Create job. Yeah, like 20, 30,000 workers and 3,000 managers and trying to get stuff done. Yeah. But they're becoming a rich nation. They also collecting taxes from other places. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's see. Uh that's that's the end of that chapter. Mm -hmm. All right. What's uh what's the next chapter? What chapter was that? Right, that was five. That was five. Start off uh six for me. I think six I'm getting into the actual temple. And it came to pass in the four hundred four hundred and eightieth year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt mm -hmm. in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph. Which is in the second month that he began to build the house of Yahoo. All right, yeah. So we we're gonna pick this up next week because now we're gonna go over the design of the temple that Solomon is putting together based off of the patterns that David got from uh, from the spirit. Right. So um, we'll pick that up next week. We'll talk about the temple. We'll talk about how Solomon blesses the temple. We're gonna go over his prayer in detail. We're gonna talk a little bit about prayer. Right, so that y'all understand the importance of prayer. It's not something that we talk about a whole lot here. You know what I'm saying? We pray every time, but it's not something that we talk about. The understanding how prayer works, the importance of prayer. So we're gonna dig into that a little bit next week. Any questions? All right, well, let's pray out. <laughs>